In the cold December night, a strange figure makes its way from the dark forests, creeping through the shadows, winding its way through the snow. Strange footprints in its wake. You can hear it coming long before it arrives. Howls and an indescribable language seem to harmonize with the wintry winds. First distant, now close, and then closer still. A slap on the wall announces its arrival. A tap on the glass draws your attention to the window. And there, a hideous face gazes in. As soon as you see it, it disappears into the darkness. A few moments of silence follows. And you think, perhaps, it's gone to haunt another. Minutes later, a knock on the door. Welcome to Strange Familiars, the sort of Christmas episode. The Yule edition. <laughs> the wintertime holiday of your choosing edition. No, this is, you know, one of the more folkloric aspects of Christmas. We're going to talk about Bell's Nickel tonight. I am drinking my peppermint water, so I am... I You're am, always on theme. I'm fully in the season. Peppermint water. Yeah, it's peppermint seltzer. No, the water just comes out of the tap peppermint here. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the North Pole. <laughs> We're at the North Pole, yeah. It's all peppermint water. Mm -hmm. It is... Uh, it makes a <laughs> spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. It's, uh, it's holiday with other natural flavors. Peppermint flavor. Like other holiday flavors? Seltzer water. You got like a pumpkin spice mixed in there. There are no pumpkin spice in this, thankfully. I don't know if I can handle a pumpkin spice water, but peppermint water. Yeah, it sounds thick. <laughs> peppermint water I like a lot. I wish they had it year round, but they only have it. That wouldn't make it special holidays. and limited edition. Before we get into our Christmas episode, 
want to thank our patrons. Strange Millers is brought to you by our patrons. And without you guys, we could not make the show. So thank you so much. If you enjoy what we do, if you like Strange Familiars, if you don't want to miss an episode, consider becoming a patron at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. For $3 a month, you can get bonus content. We do at least one bonus episode a month for patrons, and lately we've been doing two. You know, And then sometimes we do some extra stuff as well. Patrons really are the Santa Claus of Strange Familiars. <laughs> they really are. They really are. So uh, once again, thank you, patrons. That's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. And I have, of course, been on my virtual press tour for my book, Don't Look Behind You, my new book. You probably heard me on other podcasts if you listen to more than Strange Familiars. <laughs> I assume everyone listens to all the same podcasts I do. It's probably not the yeah, They case. probably watch all the same TV shows and they listen to all the same bands, too. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like a copy of Don't Look Behind You, it is on Amazon. You can get it there. That's fine. Or you can contact me if you want to sign copy. And, of course, I have my other three books as well. Tis the season. Uh, it's getting closer and closer where I don't know if media mail is going to cut it, but we can do priority mail. If you guys are on Facebook... And you're in the Strange Familiars group, you see me post my Bellsnickel paintings. So you can tell I've been pretty obsessed with this guy of late. Those paintings are for sale, by the way. If anybody wants original art, just contact me. I'm going to do a series of them. I'll probably keep painting Bellsnickel through old Christmas Day. Because I, unlike some other Scrooges I know, quite love the holidays. That was aimed at me, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm more of the, the do not go gentle into the good night. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's I look at the time as this like time that's just infused with folklore, and the things I love about it, and the things that get me fired up, are like like Krampus, like I was talking with Clint about, and like Bell's Nickel tonight, and where we used to live in Glen Rock, they have this wonderful thing where they go caroling they start at midnight on christmas eve they carol on through till dawn and they're all dressed in victorian clothes and yeah it's it's just wonderful i just i love these sort of folkloric traditions that go with christmas of course i did a whole episode on old christmas folklore last year with jerry milnes so it's there's just something about the season i like in the victorian era it was always it was a time to tell ghost stories it was sort of this extension of halloween it was this dark, cold time where you gathered around a fire. And, and in a lot of ways, it makes a lot more sense at the time of the least amount of light yeah, to yeah. tell scary stories than it does even at... Even at Halloween. Even yeah, at that's, Halloween. that's what I thought. And interestingly enough, these mumming traditions, of which mm. I was talking with Clint about this, uh, trick-or-treat is a mumming tradition, as Jerry Mills pointed out. They continue through, or they used to, mm. they continued through Christmas and Old Christmas and even, even into... January and February in some folk cultures. And now we just have the lights until that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the people who never take them down. <laughs> Part of this mumming tradition was bell snickling. And of course, we're going to talk tonight about bell snickle. He's a regional guy, right? Yes, very much so. Is he strictly regional, Pennsylvania Dutch kind of regional? Or is he like just Germanic, anyone of Germanic heritage might have had some kind of run-in with Belsnickel. No, even he's regional even to certain parts of Germany. Oh. So, like uh, Maritz Meyer, who helped me translate the Belsnickel song, which I will play at least part of in this episode, he told me he came from a Krampus area, for instance. <laughs> But not too far away from him was was this sort of Belsnickel area. So this is like the pop and soda of... Yeah, because they kind of fulfill the same folkloric role. Uh -huh. Because it's kind of the... It's not Santa Claus. You know, now yeah. Krampus kind of was strictly to scare bad kids. And mm -hmm. Belsnickel had this kind of dual role where he would he would give you a chance to... He's make... the segue into the happy, cheery, coke fantasy of right. Santa. Right, but he wasn't, he wasn't Santa Claus. He mm -hmm. was this guy, you know, you had to, he was a scary guy. So, speaking of Bell Snickle song, I think I'll have a Christmas album out. It's going to be songs and music that you hear in this episode. So, if anyone's looking for that, I will have the links in the show notes. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, people kind of think, I think nowadays, and I, I had this impression too, that Belsnickel was this kind of proto Santa Claus. Yeah, he, that's what I thought he was. He was like the skinny German Santa Claus. He was this like old time Saint Nick. And he, mm-hmm. he does and did fulfill that role sometimes. But more often he was seen as this sort of dark compatriot of Santa Claus that came. He, he'd either come like the Sunday before Christmas or on Christmas Eve, and then Santa would come after him. Oh, were they friends? Like, did they work in concert? Or? Yeah, they were kind of like, like, Bell's Nickel was kind of Santa Claus's, like... Uh, I saw the one article that you had clipped has, they talk about the one guy who's the advance agent for Santa Claus. Yeah, that's, and that's a very circus kind of... Uh, that's kind of what they... They, they had sent out the advance agents, kind of like to get you revved up for Santa Claus. Right, and like also a, to, the warm-up guy. To give kids a chance to make up for being naughty. Uh, you had that time in between Belsnickel and Santa Claus to like st- get yourself straight because <laughs> Belsnickel would come around and say, "Hey, you you've been bad," and he's carrying his his switch, uh-huh. and they said a lot of kids would straighten up in that time, uh-huh. you know, because they knew they had to get right because Santa was coming. <laughs> so Belsnickel, he's often this skinny, kind of wilder looking Santa Claus. Sometimes he's carrying an evergreen tree. Usually it's he's got a bag or a sack with him and a and a switch of some sort. Yeah, I mean in my mind he's kind of like a he's got a hoboish quality to him. Like he's almost got a bindle, you know, like he, Yeah, yeah. I mean he's patchwork. He, he just doesn't seem like whereas Santa seems like all plenty and abundance, he's very much sort of a I mean, maybe that's the German thing. Well, one of the articles, and I'm not sure if it's one of the ones I clipped or not, because I've been reading so much mm-hmm. Bell's Nickel stuff, getting ready for this episode, and it's actually some of this information is getting used in the book that Josh and I are writing. Someone actually referred to him as the poorer version of Santa Claus. They said he wasn't ri- as rich as Santa Claus. Yeah, where was was he supposed to live in a magical place, or did he just Bell's live? Nickel? Yeah. In the woods. Oh. He came from the forests. He gave the good children nuts and candies. He didn't so much, you know, bring Tonka trucks and toys. He would bring nuts and candies. He would throw them on the floor. And if the good kids picked them up, they were fine. If the bad kids went for him, he'd sometimes get them with the switch while they were trying to get the candies off the floor. <laughs> so it's kind of like a survival of the fittest kind of a test. <laughs> like Maybe. who can grab for the fastest. Maybe. And there was this tradition called bell snickling. Now, this is when people dressed up in different costumes, some as bell snickles and some just as weird stuff. It would be like Halloween. They said people would be dressed as birds and scary creatures and stuff, and they'd go door to door. And you try to guess if it, you know, if your, your bell snickles show up, you try to guess who they were from, mm-hmm. your, from your neighborhood. If you could guess, they'd sometimes give you treats. Mm-hmm. If you didn't guess, maybe you'd give them a treat or, you know, maybe you'd get the switch or... You know, it was it was this sort of neighborhood mumming tradition. There's some interesting reasons why they say that you, you always treated these costume bell snickles with respect, which we'll get into a little bit later in the episode. Were they tricksters? Well, isn't everything in the paranormal? <laughs> The name Bell Snickel comes from Germany to Pennsylvania. It was originally Pell's Nickel, and most sources agree that this Pell's is pelts or furs, and then the second part is Nicholas, as in Saint Nicholas. So it's like kind of Saint Nicholas in furs, like a wild Nicholas. Well, there are those who say that Santa Claus himself was a wild man, and indeed he was originally. But we'll, we'll get to that too. He's a little unkempt. But I did find this. This is from 1872, and it's sort of another reasoning of the name. and It's pretty interesting. This is from the Reading Times, December 25th, 1872. Belsnickel. Professor Haldeman's work on Pennsylvania Dutch defines Belsnickel as follows. Pels, a pelt, a skin with hair, as in a bear skin. Hair used as a disguise and perhaps associated with peltsen, to pelt, as in to hit. And nickel nicks, in the sense of a demon, a masked and hideously disguised person who goes from house to house on Christmas Eve, beating or pretending to beat the children and servants, and throwing down nuts and cakes before leaving. 
A noisy party accompanies him, often with a bell, which has influenced the English name. Here we have this kind of alternate name, and the pelts in is to pelt or to hit mm-hmm. something, and the nickel next being the, the demon. Mm. So we have, besides being Nicholas and Furs, which, why would he be St. Nick? Because he accompanies St. Nick. You know what I mean? He's, yeah. He is quite literally a demon or devil that beats things. And he was known to knock on houses and beat on walls and knock on the door and so forth. Going into this, I have to say, and this is a question I will answer myself. (laughs) (laughs) What else is often described in folklore as a devil that beats on things? Hint. I love this guy. (laughs) The answer is always Bigfoot. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Bigfoot. Slaps on walls, knocks on trees, taps on windows, etc., etc. I think he was in a jam band. He's so into percussion. (laughs) (laughs) So going into this, Uh this great long series of things in which I'm going to prove that Bellsnickel is indeed a wild man, I'm going to say that I'm not asserting that Bellsnickels are Bigfoot. Or Bigfoot or Bill Snickles. That's a good. That's a good assertion. I'm only saying that they both come from the same folkloric tradition of wild men. So you have this tradition of wild men. Bell Snickle comes from it. So does Bigfoot. Does he have like the whole accompanying narrative, like the wife and the whole backstory and everything? Bell Snickle as, yeah. as Santa Claus. You mean? Yeah, Santa Claus has. No, no, not that I know of. He's just this crazy, scary he just guy. Just shows up. Yeah. So most cultures have a wild man tradition. It's often Bigfoot or Bigfoot-like things. Everybody knows the Yeti in Nepal and Tibet, the Almas in Greater Asia and Russia, the Scottish fairy Gilly Doo, black-haired and clothed in moss and leaves. Connecting Gilly Doo to Bellsnickel said he was said to be kind to children but also wild and unpredictable. And in other parts of the UK, you had the Wadwos or the Woodwise Wild Man of the UK, and I noticed a lot of people spell that wood woes mm-hmm. uh, to emphasize the wood. But in Old English, wad, W-O-D, could mean wood, but it was also a reference to Odin or Woden at the time. So it had this kind of dual meaning that I think is lost on a lot of people. They think it just means wood-wise. These are guys out in the people woods. People of the woods. But it could also mean like Odin-wise, but in the sense that you were touched by Odin. And to be touched by something would mean a little a little crazy. Ah. So crazy in the sense of the way like saints and mystics were crazy. That kind of like off. Like they would say people who could see fairies were touched oftentimes. So it also has that meaning, which I think is lost on people a lot. I think they just think it means this wild man of the woods and that's all it means. But it would ha- it would have had this kind of almost dual meaning to people at the time. And isn't the, the, the idea that they're touched, isn't it that they just have sort of a link to another world. And yeah. so they can't really fit entirely into the original world that everyone else fits into because they can see into the other world. Yeah, oh, absolutely, totally. If you're touched by Odin, you're a little... Yeah, or, or by the fairies or so forth. But, I mean, I think it's important to emphasize that because that gets lost so much. People will talk about wad woes or, or, or wood woes. Mm. They'll pronounce it nowadays a lot. Either is fine. But the, they've lost that odin or woden connection to it and is this similar to like a green man kind of figure very similar very very similar yeah uh, the green man kind of fulfills that same role and europe had various wild men they always came out for ritual purposes these wild men were associated with various holidays christmas carnival etc cetera, etc cetera. they're almost always hair covered frightening creatures and there's a fantastic article which you can still find online if you look up Europe's Wild Men. It's in National Geographic. It's a photo essay from uh, 2013. It's also in the April 2013 issue of National Geographic. Fantastic photo essay on, on these wild man costumes. They show all these different costumes from all over Europe of these different wild men. I think you can still get that for free online if you look it up. Now, is this just as common in urban areas as it was in rural areas? Or is this kind of specifically like a rural small community kind of a thing? Well, they actually address that in some of the, the Belsnickel articles. Mm-hmm. They actually say that Belsnickel is more of a rural thing, and I guess that would make sense when you're closer to the woods if this guy's supposed to come from the woods. Yeah, and it does seem like it's very much rooted in community. Like you, I love the idea that's so, such a German or Pennsylvania Dutch thing to have people arrive at your door and you only give them treats if you know them. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, it is. Very much so. Otherwise, why are you here? <laughs> and of course, First Nations people in America have names for these wild men, you know, as many Yeah, and I'm struck by how similar those sort of ceremonial costumes look. Exactly. And that's the point. Like we have no problem saying when one of these tribes uses whatever their their native name is for these wild men, saying that, oh, they're talking about a Bigfoot. But these European wild men they're just these ritual figures. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, it's like they're it's a separate thing all of a sudden. But yet these Native American tribes, they still have these wild man costumes that they use for ritual purposes, just like the European wild man costumes. I mean, sure, they, you know, culturally they're a little different. The, the, the art and so forth is a little different, but they're serving the same purpose, this kind of wild man archetype. I guess that's one of the big Jungian things, right? The wild man is one of his big archetypes. That's one of the things we, we need for some reason. Like a flannel man. <laughs> What is that? Like, right? Maybe fl- is flannel man a wild man? In a way, I guess he he could be. Or is he like the? If he's a lumberjack, yeah, is he the bridge between? Is he the? Well, I like that idea because so many people, you know, myself included, we've kind of come to this conclusion that he seems like he's while his presence in itself is scary, that he seems just as startled to be there, yeah, as as we are to see him. I think we need to talk a little bit about the abominable snowman and Yukon Cornelius here. <laughs> I have nothing prepared in that. <laughs> Zero notes on the bumble. The bumble. As he was called. He which, is, when I was a kid, like a little... little I yeah. wouldn't even look. Yeah. When he came on, I wouldn't even look. And yeah, now but, he's so cuddly. Oh, cute. I love him, right? But when I was like a, like a... I mean, like a little, little, like three years old. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I, like... I Don't even like, look at the bump. Oh. It's like looking at the blue monkeys. You know what's going to happen. They're just going to pick you up. Oh, the blue monkeys were horrifying too, right? <laughs> so I guess the question is, are these wild man archetypes, are they just something people saw and turned into something? Or because they're associated with these rituals and like high holy days, does that suggest something deeper with these things? I always think that there's like a cautionary or moralizing element to keep people away from the woods. Always. I mean, and I think there's a, a lot of that in folklore in general. Or like you, you know, said, stay this on the idea. path. Yes, yeah, stay on the path. Little Red Riding Hood, you know, get to Grandma's Hansel house. And Gretel. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because I guess the idea is that if you're apart from society and you're living on your own, mm-hmm. that there's an element of crazy to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's... It's probably part of, like, keeping a community together. Yeah, it could have served that purpose. I mean, in the same way that, you know, a lot of the Anabaptist traditions, the Amish, it's all about keeping the community together at all costs. One of these Bell's Nickel articles that I ran into, it was this kind of funny story about this guy recollecting going door to door, dressed as a Bell's Nickel, and he goes into this one house. They didn't even ask sometimes. They just barged in because it was such a part of the tradition. Mm-hmm. Like, you'd know why somebody should. You wouldn't shoot him. You'd know yeah. why somebody should. Yeah. <laughs> so this guy barges into this house and he's, you know, dancing around the Bell's Nickel and he says, it was this old order Amish guy. And he was like, we don't do that here. Get out. <laughs> it's like, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sitting so in the dark. <laughs> me being, I'm going to say, 275 times more woo than you, probably. Woo! I think that's uh, a conservative estimate. That right. Let's go. <laughs> I'm going to say that I think it. there is a deeper connection. There's something, the fact that he, these wild men are associated with these rituals and these, these high holy days says that there's something else going, there's something deeper to them. It's not just an animal. And now we get to Belsnickel the Wild Man. Is there any talk about what he does the rest of the year? I know Santa just like kind of gears up. <laughs> there isn't. I mean, he just comes from the woods, Belsnickel, as far as... Is there, a, like, I, with Santa, you know, there's you're supposed to leave things for him, cookies and whatever. Is there off an offering made to Belsnickel? Um, there often was. It wasn't anything formal. I mean, people would talk about asking him to sit down and... And offering him booze, and they said by the time he got to about the fifth house, <laughs> he was pretty well out of his mind on mm-hmm. booze. But that's the the costume Belsnickel. Now, I'm going to point out some common factors as we go. There's just a bunch of articles we're going to run through, bunch of things. I'm going to talk about the connections to other wild man archetype, in particularly Bigfoot, as we go. Some of them are just fun stories. Some of them are, are interesting. A lot of them are short. I'll start out with a longer one, which kind of tells this sort of uh, neat recollection of Bell's Nichols. 
and we'll just go from there and we'll have all these different Belsnickel stories at the end of the night here. This is from the Pottsville Republican, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. It's from 1970, but it's a guy recollecting his father's memory. So these are stories his father had told him. I think this guy was pretty old when he was writing this in 1970. When the bell snickle came, I never saw him, but I know there was a Santa Claus. I never saw the bell snickle, but I know there was one. My father saw him when he was a little boy, and he told me about him. This is what he told me. The bell snickle was a horrible creature. He could be half man and half beast. He wasn't always the same. He was a bad fairy kind of monster, and he could take on any disguise he wanted. One time he would come dressed all in fur, and he would run in the house on all fours and make horrible growlings, and he would snap like a mad dog. Other times he would come dressed in a Joseph's coat of all colors and patches. He'd have an old fur cap on his head, and there would be bells sewed to it. His face could be covered with a beard and sharp-pointed mustachios. And on the tails of his ragged coat and on the sleeves there would be more bells. When that bell snickle came into the house, he would prance around and laugh and yell and jump at people, all the time shaking all over so the bells clattered. Sometimes bell snickle would come like a great ghost, all in a white sheet, with a scary white hood and a great black and blood red eyes. Oh, he was fearful, a bad, bad thing. Bell snickle always came on Christmas Eve, and he most always came about the time when my sister and my brothers and I were hanging up our stockings. We had a fireplace in the big front parlor, and there our stockings must go to be filled by Kris Kringle. There was a great scuffling and shouting, laughter, and near tears as we all tried to find our biggest, longest stocking and fought for the best place, the ends of the mantle, to hang them. We were certain they would be filled to overflowing, though mother and father warned that only good boys and girls got gifts, and there wasn't one of us but maybe Katie, yes, and little Joni that would get a single solitary thing, or maybe an onion. That made me feel pretty good, being little Joni, the youngest of the seven boys who made up our family, and just a year older than my sister Katie. Well, we were romping and clawing away when, almost all of a sudden, there came the most tremendous crashing knock on the kitchen door. We stood stunned. For a few seconds, we didn't know what it was. Then the terrible thought struck us all at once. It was the bell snickle. Al, he was my oldest brother, swaggered. I ain't scared, he bragged. Little Katie started to cry. My mother took her in her arms and told her not to be afraid. If she was a good girl, the bell snickle wouldn't hurt her. Nobody bothered to save me. There was another pounding at the door. A rough voice bellowed, Open the door. I'm looking for all the bad children in the whole wide world. <laughs> Mother and father herded us into the kitchen. My father opened the door as another crashing knock and an unearthly yowl came from the without. In came the most terrible monster we had ever seen. I yelled in terror and started to run, bumping into the table and knocking over a few assorted chairs. Big Brother Al grabbed me and hung on. Don't let him scare you, he quavered. But I was scared already. So was Al. And so were all the rest of us boys. Belsnickel was all done up in an old coat that had red and blue and crazy quilt patches all over it. There was a big belt around the coat, and he had felt miner's boots on his feet. On his head there was a big old furred cap. His face was covered with a gray beard and a mustache. On his hat and on the coat sleeves and on the tails of his coat were little bells that rang every time he moved. On his back there was a peddler's pack. It was knobby and rough as if there were lots of things in it. In his right hand the Belsnickel carried a long whip. We children stood sweating, trembling. Belsnickel's eyes glittered in a furry face. He unslung the big pack from his back. He reached into it and grabbed a handful of candy and nuts and threw them on the floor. For the good boys and girls, he shouted. Down on the floor we scrambled. This Belsnickel wasn't the ogre we had feared after all. But ah, the trust of the little child. Our fat little bottoms stretched our pants. Belsnickel gripped the whip tight and started to flail away. The lash stung our behinds. Laughter gave way to yells of pain. Only little Katie escaped. After all, she was only a baby. But the rest of us ran around the kitchen in a panic, trying to dodge the stinging, whistling whip. My father and mother tried to keep sober faces, but finally burst out laughing. (laughs) <laughs> Child abuse is funny. <laughs> Belsnickel, sweating, left off the whipping. He stood back and surveyed his weeping prey. You've done things bad all year, what you didn't get whipped for. 
Now that makes up for them times. Next year you do bad things, you fess up to it. Then maybe I won't have to whip you. With that, he dug deep into his pack and gave us each a handful of goodies. Merry Christmas, he shouted. He leaned over and kissed my smiling mother, shook hands with my father, and bounded out the door. That was Bellsnickel, and it was the year 1865, and I was four years old, and the next year the war would end. And that was how Bellsnickel came at Christmas Eve. The Bellsnickel is almost as old as the first heavy wave of German immigrants into Pennsylvania. Earliest reference to the custom of Bellsnickeling is in the York Gazette of December 23, 1823, which warned Bellsnickel to keep within the limits of the hall. Same article continues from the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Gazette of December 29, 1827. This Mr. Belschnickel. Now, sometimes it's Belschnickel, sometimes it's Pelsnickel, sometimes it's... Is there anything to do with... I, I know in this description they were talking about him having bells around. I mean, is is the Belsnickel have anything to do no, with him they, actually they said having it, bells? They said it was, you know, it was basically Pelsnickel, and it became... The English thought they were saying bells because he had bells on. Uh, so that's how it became okay. Bellsnickel, apparently. This Mr. Bellsnickel is a visible personage, ebony in appearance but topaz in spirit. He is the precursor of the jolly old elf Chris Kringle, or St. Nicholas, and makes his personal appearance dressed in skins or old clothes. His face black, a bell, a whip, and a pocket full of cakes or nuts. And either the cakes or the whip are bestowed upon those around, as may seem meet to his sable majesty. It is no sooner dark than the Belschnickel's bell is heard flitting from house to house, accompanied by the screams and the laughter of those whom he is paying his respects. Chris Kringle, or St. Nicholas, is never seen. He slips down the chimney and deposits his presents in their prepared stocking. The description of Belschnickel as having a punch in Lake Middle, which is in perpetual shake, is reminiscent of a poem by Clement Moore, A Visit from St. Nicholas, in which the jolly elf is described as having a round little belly that looks like a bowl full of jelly. In Moore's poem, however, St. Nicholas is the benevolent one who brings presents rather than punishment for past sins. Belsnickel is found not only in the folklore of Pennsylvania, but the actual Belsnickel could be found wandering the towns on Christmas Eve in backwoods, North Carolina, Virginia, and in Nova Scotia until the late 1920s, also West Virginia. So what's the link between... Are, are those people all of the same heritage? They're all German, yeah. Oh, they're all German. The rural Belschnickel had his counterpart in the cities of the day. The urban Belschnickel was more in the nature of our Halloween trick-or-treat hobgoblin. In the Berks County Historical Society Library is the unpublished diary of James L. Morris of Morgantown. Of the Belschnickel, he says, December 24th, 1831, Christmas Eve, saw two Chris Kindles tonight, the first I have seen in these many years. They were horrid, frightful-looking objects. And dating December 24th, 1842, Christmas Eve, a few Belsnickels prowling about this evening, frightening the women and children with their uncouth appearance, made of cast-off garments, made party-colored patches, a false face, a shaggy head of tow, or rather a wig, falling profusely over the shoulders and finished out by a most patriarchal beard of whatsoever foreign that could possibly be pressed into service. From the Reading Burks and Chilco Journal, December 27, 1851, Parents within doors were making all sorts of purchases for distribution on the morrow, while juvenile harlequins were running from house to house, scattering nuts, confections, consternation, and amusement in their way. From the Easton Daily Express, December 26, 1866, men and boys dressed in most fantastic garb paraded the streets in numbers and caused considerable merriment to those who were fortunate enough to witness their amusing costumes and fantastic tricks. From the Norristown Herald, Free Press, December 31st, 1851, Christmas Eve was celebrated with processions of Kris Kringles, arrayed in all their fantastic costumes, who paid their annual visit to the shopkeepers and citizens, soliciting good things, and rendering an equivalent in caricaturing the sable sons of our soil. So that's a lot there, but notice they always describe them as horrible, frightening. You know, this wasn't a, this wasn't a kindly old elf. You know, he was... He wasn't a jo like like your grandpa, kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was scary, <laughs> scared people. The blackface is interesting because later on, of course, this is attributed to minstrel shows. And they say that, like, when people dressed up, they dressed up like minstrel shows. Maybe. Maybe, but I think, like, if we look to those European wild men, they're painting their faces, too, you know? Sometimes. More of just a mask as opposed to adopting a particular... Yeah, racial stereotype. And, of course, wild men 
are often said to have black skin. So I'm just, you know, Bob Man being Bigfoot, always said to have black or gray skin. Well, not always, but often. More often than not. Is that because they're misconstruing hair for skin? In some cases, probably. But, I mean, some people specifically say, no, he's definitely black. Like, like, like ebony black. Not like an African-American person, but like, like painted black, almost black. Like a gorilla, I guess more. Mm-hmm. And the knocking on the on the houses, the knocking on the doors, the yelling. Uh, did they mention the strange language in this article? Was that in this article where he said it was an no, unknown? No, that must be another. Okay, article. it must be in another article. But these are all, you know, these are all Bigfoot things, or wild man things. I just say. So I just find it really interesting. I, again, I'm not saying Bell Snickle is Bigfoot, but it's this expression of the wild man archetype that has come from Europe to America. It's definitely something that walked out of the woods. Yeah, absolutely. A Second Christmas from the Philadelphia Inquirer, 27th of December, 1937. It is the heritage of no particular race, the early Finns and Swedes who settled down the Delaware and eventually spread as far north as Southwark, had their second Christmas celebrations with roving bands of merrymakers. Certainly the early Germans, of which many came to Pennsylvania, had their Belsnickel, who was represented by men and boys in disguise. These went from house to house demanding tribute. They usually got it, on the theory that one could not tell which was actually the wicked rogue Belsnickel and which was the impersonator. And certainly as years rolled round, Irish, English, and Scots in far south Philadelphia, the Neck, absorbed these practices and added a few New Year's customs of their own. Kind of like the the mums, the mummers parade. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is that where mumming comes from, is the mummers parade? I mean, it was one of these mumming traditions, certainly. Mm -hmm. And that's a New Year's Day. Yeah, that's a New Year's Day thing. So it was probably an old Christmas thing, and it became a New Year's thing. There was considered to be a wicked rogue Belsnickel, and that's why you gave the people treats, because you never knew which one was the real Belsnickel. You're hedging your bets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that was pretty awesome. So this is a neat story. This is from the Evening Sun in Baltimore, Maryland. So it, it did, Belsnickel did make his, his journey southward. Santa's advance agent brings Forest Park joy. Old Belsnickel, legendary character portrayed by August C. Lures, 74. This is from the Evening Sun, Baltimore, Maryland, December 18th, 1929. Christmas this year for a group of children in Forest Park will be doubly joyous. They have been examined by an agent of Santa Claus himself and have been found deserving of presents. It was an anxious time for someone Lorraine Avenue the other night when Belsnickel appeared with his long white beard and switch. Belsnickel, according to German fable, is a character who comes out of the woods each Christmas to interview children, decide if they are good or bad, and recommend to Santa Claus the favors they should be accorded. August C. Lures of 4815 Forest Park Avenue has kept up the old tradition for over half a century and has been Belsnickel himself for 27 years. Though originally it was a family affair, it has come to be a regular feature of Christmas in Forest Park. The other night, Mr. Lures slayed Belsnickel to over 60 children. There were gathered at his son's house on Lorraine Avenue, four of his other children, 59 grandchildren. Holy moly! 59 grandchildren and 22 great-grandchildren to say nothing of the most of the children in the neighborhood. Belsnickel waved his switch terrifyingly, more or less, over the young ones one by one and pulled his beard thoughtfully as he listened to records of home and school life and there were no untruths. Parents were too close in the background. He heard some terrible confessions of lessons not done just as they should be, of errands unrun, and the switch whistled through the air perilously near at times. Belsnickel knew just how to deal with the children. As a plain Baltimorean, he was a magistrate for 17 years from 1910 to 1927, but he didn't carry out his duties too strictly and forgave freely. Mr. Lures will be 74 next October. Friday last was the first time a doctor has attended him for sickness. So it's just a sweet story of a guy playing Belsnickel for some kids. But I did like how they, they point out that he comes from the woods. That's where Belsnickel comes from. This is a good one. I like this one. Terrified by Santa Claus. <laughs> Girl's dreadful fright brought to her death's door. Wernersville, Pennsylvania, January 12, 1896. As the result of being frightened by a practical Santa Claus, Miss Emma A. Spahn is now thought to be dying. On Christmas Eve, she and her mother assisted a neighbor in putting up a Christmas tree. 
While they were thus engaged, some parties outside, attired as bell-snickles, knocked at the door. Miss Spawn's attention was suddenly attracted, and she was so frightened at the sight that she was taken home ill. She grew rapidly worse, and her life is now despaired of. Did she make it, Tim? <laughs> I don't know. That's your department. You have to, you have to look up her death certificate. <laughs> I, w- I would love to see if it says... Uh, death by bell snow. Yeah. <laughs> but no, window peeking and scaring the pants off of somebody. That's a Bigfoot thing. Bigfoot peeks in windows and scares the heck out of people. So again, not saying bell snickel is Bigfoot, just saying these are a lot of common traits of wild men. And it is fulfilling that, that wild man archetype. I'm going to do two because this is a really short one. I just I just like this one. Whiskey, beer, and bell snickels formed a partnership here and nearly scared some children into convulsions. That's the whole article. That's from the Morning Call, Allentown, Pennsylvania, December 30th, 1905. This bell snickling went on well into January, probably to old Christmas, which was usually between the 6th and 8th of January. I forget how they... If you go back and listen to last year's show, Jerry will tell you how they compute old Christmas. <laughs> I forget off the top of my head. It's like a, a moon-based thing, like when, when certain holidays fall? Yeah, it's something like that. There's a, there's a way to... It's so many days after Advent or whatever. I'm, mm. not, I'm not exactly sure. This is from the Philadelphia Inquirer, December 22nd, 1936. There is something to be said, however, in the favor of the old world roots of the thing. Vaguely, the entire matter gets confused somehow with Halloween, when children go from door to door asking cakes and cider. Today, these things are given out of quaint regard for tradition. But once the gifts were made to appease evil spirits, the theory was this. One cannot tell because of the disguises adopted, which is spirit and which is human, therefore freely give to all. German folklore devised Belsnickel, a kind of antithesis to Santa Claus. There are those living today who can remember how as children they were frightened with the threat that Belsnickel would come and take away their Christmas toys if they were not good. Belsnickel, as envisioned, was certainly a wicked rogue, with a cap and bells and a big whip, He visited homes around the New Year's period, demanded tribute, and got it. It is particular that, to this day, in some countries, gifts are exchanged on New Year's Day and not on Christmas. Another Another instance of saying, give freely to everyone, I guess, because you don't know which one's the real bell snickle. (laughs) Not because it's the right thing to do. The following is a bell snickle poem originally written by Henry Harbaugh in the 1800s. It was translated by George Folkers, and it appears in The Christmas Bell Snickle, an account from the Union County Historical Society. I have made a few changes to the wording to make it a bit friendlier for the modern reader. Cody Dickerson pointed me in the direction of this bell snickle poem first, so thank you, Cody. Something from old Bell Snickle, and that I will never forget. 
shall you reap the fruits of your labor at last. Now a few closing remarks. We found early one objection to all the exercises of the evening, and it was the coming into the house of God, a character who was named Chris Kringle, or Bell Snickle, as he's sometimes called. Now this we thought, and still do think so, was altogether uncalled for, and very inappropriate on such a, an occasion, the celebration of the advent of our blessed Savior. God was certainly not pleased with this part of the exercises. It, it is impossible. The appearance of the, this character in God's house, remember, where his name is recorded, and where honor dwelleth, did not make the desired impression. We feel it our duty as God's servant to make these remarks. We make them in love. We make them for the good of all of us and for the glory of God. May they have their desired effect. When's that from? This is from the 15th of January, 1874. So, yeah, I like that because it was like like this this character, this bell, like, oh, he's not appropriate for the church, this, this horrible yeah, he's guy. He's an other. Yeah. I think they've tried to... To marry the, you know, Santa as this benevolent sort of um, Jesus-like character who gives to everyone in the world, like he's just an all-loving kind of guy. Mm -hmm. But he really is the wild man that that walked out of. Yeah. I don't know why they never address the fact that Santa Claus or any of these characters pretty much embody the exact thing you tell your children the rest of the year to a to run from (laughs) okay so go sit on a stranger's lap tell him some secrets and in return he'll promise you gifts for (laughs) possibly give you candy while you're sitting there possibly giving you candy yeah it's what about the giant rabbit (laughs) on on the first or right around the first of spring right yeah this is from the central news percasey pennsylvania maybe percasey percasey i don't know January 4th, 1940. The Belsnickel, that ghostly apparition, which according to Pennsylvania German tradition, stalks about the countryside during the Yule season, made a personal appearance on Chestnut Street above Fifth several nights ago, and were the residents of that vicinity aroused? The first inkling of the ghostly form came when a resident was awakened at 3 a.m. by a blood-curdling noise, which according to his interpretation, sounded like a cross between a groan and a shriek. Spell it, we commanded, of our informant, and he began A H H N E E E E E or something like that, he said, which would be uh The aroused resident sleepily crawled from his bed to peer through the window, and he beheld the form of a man clad in an ankle length flowing white robe, beneath which protruded two bare feet. The form paced back and forth on the walk aside of the dwelling, with its head turned to heaven and continued with increasing volume the weird sounds. Other residents of the neighborhood were aroused with bated breath, observed the weird spectacle, but none had the nerve to make complete investigation. Presently, a celebrant of the holiday season happened along. He spied the ghost and halted temporarily in his tracks. After a moment's hesitation, he turned and ran up Chestnut Street at a speed that made Gene the Taylor's gate in the hometown movies look like going backwards. That seems like a very particular reference. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's a, a film of the time. It was hilarious then. <laughs> <laughs> Presently, the lady of the house at which the ghost was stalking was aroused from her deep slumber and noted that her husband was missing from his bed. She went downstairs and through the window saw the ghost. Is that you? She inquired. Well, who do you think it is? Open the door. I'm locked out and have been howling here for the past 15 minutes to arouse someone, retorted the ghost. The explanation? A pet dog in the household, thoroughly housebroken, mounted the stairway to his master's bedroom and in dog language said, I gotta go out. The dutiful master crawled out of bed in his nightgown, went downstairs to put out the dog. He stepped to the front porch and the door closed on him. He pressed the doorbell button, but the darn thing was out of order. He hammered on the door without results, at which he stood outside the house calling for Ani. It was exactly 12 above zero with a stiff breeze blowing. So... You know, a certainly completely mundane explanation for that, but I do like that he was this ghostly figure was considered a bell snake. So this is an excerpt from the Lancaster Daily Intelligencer from December twenty fourth, eighteen eighty one. Only one of the elder boys, the housemaid and myself, in addition to the old folks, participated in the preparation of the tree. 
All the others were the victims of the harmless little ruse which parents saw fit to resort to once a year in order to furnish an agreeable surprise and pleasure to their little ones, whose boxes, hats, caps, and stockings occupied different books and corners to receive the gifts of the bell's nickel. To good little boys and girls, and somehow all claimed to be good on that occasion at least, but when the bell's nickel appeared in his proper person on Christmas Eve with his hideous visage, his bag of nuts, and his long whip jingling his bells withal, and speaking in a dialect that seemed to have been brought from the confusion of Babel, the children were not quite so sure of their goodness. If they did not fly in terror from his presence and hide themselves under the remotest corner of their beds, the name of Santa Claus, so far as I can remember, had then no currency in the rural districts of our county. It was the bells nickel that rewarded good children and punished bad ones, and it was he who filled the stocking legs, the hats, the caps, and boxes on Christmas night. These gifts to children, and indeed all gifts passing between the young and the old, were severally termed, Be Christ Kindly, but as little was heard and known of Chris Kringle as of Santa Claus. The language, the unknown language, coming from before the time of Babel or whatever, that comes up in a couple articles, but... Again, we have the Bigfoot with the samurai chatter, the unknown language. He's using a language that we can't decipher, some kind of strange, unheard language that people have actually recorded, supposedly associated with Bigfoot. So again, it's you know another attribute, just another thing they're sharing between them. This is from an old publication. It's an old folklore publication of which I'm not done collecting issues yet. I have several issues, but I do not have them all. So until that time, this publication will remain nameless. (laughs) But there's an article in the Christmas issue. This is uh, from the 1950s. Two and three generations ago, the most important event for the children in rural farm areas on Christmas Eve was the arrival of Derbelschnickel. This awesome personage was usually garbed in old clothes, and it always concealed his face behind some crude mask. In one hand, it carried a bag of walnuts or candy, while on the other hand maintained a firm grip on a large whip or switch. I like that they call it it as well in this article. Mm. After this strange individual had ascertained to his satisfaction that the children of the household had behaved quite satisfactorily during the past year, it threw the candy and walnuts on the floor. As the eager children grasped for these favors, however, they were often whipped smartly across the knuckles, and many of the more timid youngsters were quite frightened by the stern individual. Sooner or later, the strange visitor would depart from the scene, and the children were then free to gather the tidbits left behind. Only the more discerning youngsters saw any resemblance between Der Belschnickel and a neighbor or member of the very same family. This, then, was the general pattern for Christmas Eve, but there were many variations. The recollection of some of the older inhabitants of the Perkyoman Valley vividly reconstruct the scene as it appeared many years ago. Miss Emma Stolfer of Sassamonsville remembered that Dirt Belschnickel came to her mother's store in Corntown for many years. He always wore an old overcoat and covered his head with an old stocking, which had holes cut out for the eyes. Mrs. Mabel S. Berkey recalls that as a girl she was always deathly afraid of Dirt Belschnickel, who always came to her house with several companions. It was her practice to keep the dining room table between herself and the strange arrivals. Dr. E. E. S. Johnson said that Der Belschnickel always ran around outside of their home, making queer noises and tapping on the windows with a stick. He finally recalled that on one particularly dark Christmas Eve, two men who had come to his home to play Belschnickel tripped and fell into an uncovered water trough behind the house. Mr. Jacob Reef, formerly of Skip Pack, declared that his mother was accustomed to dress up as Der Belschnickel on Christmas Eve and be darned we didn't know her. Mr. Reef said it was common practice for small groups of older people in his area to go around bell snickling on Christmas Eve. These groups would then receive food and drink at the various farmhouses which they had visited. Mrs. Geneva S. Reef, who had no personal recollections of Der Belschnickel, said that her mother hated Christmas Eve for many years because the visitor to her home was particularly mean. This Belsnickel would put out plates of candy in front of the children as they sat around the table, but as soon as one of the children would try to touch his candy, he would whip them on his arm. Miss Ella Schultz said that Der Belschnickel never frequented her home, but the neighboring children informed her that he came to their house and always covered his face with a handkerchief. Mrs. Charles Conway remembered that she was several times forced to dance in front of Der Belschnickel. <laughs> Mrs. Rebecca Frommer said that Der Belschnickel always rattled the windows and doors before making an entrance. He always made the children recite poems and say prayers before they were given candy and little cakes. On several occasions, he was visited by a female Belschnickel and received the customary whipping. 
It is certainly apparent that there is little, if any, resemblance between Santa Claus of today and Der Belschnickel of yesterday. Although Santa Claus has successfully driven Der Belschnickel from the Christmas scene, <laughs> this modern usurper must still prove his worth. The children of today will certainly not have as many fond recollections as do our elders who were children during the reign of Der Belschnickel. <laughs> Once again, tapping on windows, knocking on walls, just odd strangeness. In all of this Belsnickel research, I found an old Belsnickel song, which I had translated with the help of Moritz Meyer and Jerry Drake. It seems like it was maybe a traditional song it it was written in the paper i think probably by someone who spoke pennsylvania german but did not write it because both of my translator friends were like there's some things here that just don't kind of make sense mm -hmm. spelling wise so it sounds like somebody was phonetically yeah yeah like they spoke it but didn't write it perhaps with their help i translated it and kind of set it to the tune they set it to set to. I kind of adjusted it. Um, it's not a direct translation, but this is a Belsnickel song that is derived from this perhaps traditional song found in the newspaper. along with some other music will be available on my Christmas album which will be at stonebreath.bandcamp.com if anyone is interested and patrons you will get a free download of that album a free download code Holiday thoughts, Allison. In particular. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of Bell's Nickel? <laughs> I imagine I'd be afraid of him. <laughs> I'm just taking a leap here. Yeah, I've gotten a new insight into this Bell's Nickel guy. 
you can see by my painting from, I think it was from two years ago, of Bell Snickle, he's just a very kind of old-timey Santa Claus. And then my new paintings are absolute wild men. I, I really got a view into the character of this guy, and I absolutely love it. I love that we have... Because yeah, I always thought of him as like the Pennsylvania Dutch Santa, the proto-Santa. But he's not so much a proto... I mean, there are definitely things he, that are similar about the two. He's very much in this European wild man tradition. And this costumed wild man that comes on holidays at these you know these ritual times and it does seem like it's softened over time like instead of this very um you know a lot of those german folk tales are punitive <laughs> oh yeah it's about keeping people in line and um santa claus seems to have more of a a jovial benevolence but he's lacking the mysticism in the I yeah mean, I... the only the only sort of mystery is how he gets the, all those presents to everybody or how he gets them done. There isn't a mystery. And you know the backstory on Santa. You right. know where he comes he, from. You know where he lives. He it's a defined just, place he comes from. He has he's a got family. A wife. He yeah. seems really grounded. Yeah. He's got if, like. Other than the slave labor, he puts the elves to. <laughs> <laughs> but even that, I mean, he's in a place. He has a job. Right. He's married. He doesn't just walk out of the woods once a year to your house with a switch. Right. You leave him milk and cookies, which is an offering. Uh That is an offering to a spirit. That's something that survived from the old days. But beyond that, I mean, it's it's a very kind, very genteel offering. You know, it's not, you know, Belsnickel's bringing nuts. He's bringing stuff from the forest. Mm -hmm. It gets more tamed with time. And you wonder if that was purely just trying to take the edge off or trying to make it kindlier you know so like that last article i read about the i don't know if it's the last one the one article i read it was it wasn't a, a but Santa Claus thing. appeared in parts of the country where there was no precedence of bell snickle right bell snickle is is you know really unique to certain pockets of german immigrants and probably german immigrants that came from specific areas of germany and austria just like there were specific areas for, like you said, the different um, elves and things. Yeah, they have, you know, different, uh, you know, Trotterhead, which is a, a creature mentioned in The Long Lost Friend. That comes from certain areas. His equivalent is, I'm going to, I forget the other names for him, but basically there were these different nightmare creatures of which, you know, he was one. And they have different names depending on different parts of Germany and so forth. Pennsylvania Dutch is, uh, or Pennsylvania German, known as Pennsylvania Dutch, mm-hmm. or Deitch. It's uh, it's pretty unique language. I guess it's a it's a combination of like High German and Luxembourgish or something like that, and then it shares some commonality with other Germanic based dialects, like. Yiddish and even though they're they're not Jewish people like I think it's the fact that it, it's a Germanic dialect right that's been, that's uh, in a little secular area yeah it's it's very interesting I didn't know it was that different from German you, you know I, I sent it over to to Maritz who's my friend in Germany who, who translates a lot of German for me and it's uh it's not a direct you know one-to-one it's not like he can he, he has to do a little bit of digging to get to the bottom of it. But uh, yes, so I've, I've fallen in love with Belsnickel. I'm going to do more Belsnickel paintings. And I've just, uh, I, want to, I want to reinstitute the tradition. Don't show up at people's houses. <laughs> well, I was thinking. It's not like you don't bear more than a passing resemblance. Right, I would make a good Belsnickel. You would not? make a good Belsnickel. You just have to get some porcupine quills and a flappy hat. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, you wear red velvet pants pretty much every day. So. <laughs> I, I do You're have four a, feet tall. I do have a red velvet shirt. But, or velvet. It's not velvet, It's but it's soft. Felt, I guess. Shirt? I don't know. What is that? Flannel. It's a red flannel shirt, but it's not checked. Yeah. I'm flannel man without the checks. That's about my favorite winter shirt. Uh, no, I was thinking of making it voluntary, where people could sign up if they wanted to visit from Bell's Nickel. And... Uh, I would roll in. 
I wouldn't whip any kids. I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a mean bell snickle. <laughs> I'm not above putting a little, a little scare into them. You know, knock on the window a little bit and come in and throw some walnuts down or something. I'm for any entity that brings candy, <laughs> whether it's a rabbit, whether you go and get it at somebody's house. So happy holidays, everybody. Thank you for listening. As I said, we're going to try to do a bunch of content heading up to the holidays here. We know it can be a hard time for people. So hopefully we can give you some extra shows to help anybody uh, who wants a little distraction through the holiday season. They won't all be holiday themed. <laughs> no, they won't. This, this will probably be the last holiday themed one. Until a really awesome holiday like Groundhog Day comes along. <laughs> I don't know. Could we get a show out of Groundhog Day? I don't know if that would be that interesting. I'm pretty people. sure that we could get an interview with either Octorora Orphe or <laughs> Punxsutawney Phil. Well, let's get through New let's, Year's first and yeah, old Christmas. Yeah, let's get through 2018. Again, thanks everybody for listening. If you need a Bell Snickle, I'm available for Bell Snickle bookings. And check out my books. Look me up on Amazon. Thanks once again to the patrons. Happy holidays to everyone, whatever holiday you celebrate in the winter. Merry Christmas to those who celebrate Christmas. We will be possibly in Glen Rock to see the carolers. So if anybody's in the area, maybe you'll see us there. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts. Music, books, art, podcasts, and more. You can go to darkhollerarts.com for more. If you're on Facebook, check out the Strange Familiars Gathering group on Facebook. We share news about the podcast and photos and news stories and so forth. Just look up Strange Familiars Gathering on Facebook. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. Go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com for more. Where the stones have blended